very interesting rereading, I don't know, Oscar Wilde now, when he writes about politics, and he already sees in the 19th century looking at Russia as like the empire of evil and Russian Tsars as these bloodthirsty humiliators of their own people and other nations. Should the response be, yes, you've chosen to go to war with us and you're going to lose and your ruler is a moron who has chosen a war which he will lose. <laughs>
because of обстоятельства. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that question always shows that people haven't quite got the political psychology of Russia, and they're slightly applying a, a very Western idea of belief and individuality to a very very different context. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I'll I'll ask s several questions about Russia. Yeah, knowing that that you are not specialized on Russia only. Yeah, sure. But but you you used to live in Russia for almost ten years, so you you know something about the the issue. Um, in one of your recent interviews, I guess you said that that actually uh, Putin was elected mm. as the war leader, and Russians knew whom they elected and they elected him because they and they supported him because they knew that that he is capable to wage war and he is capable to kill people uh, does it mean that this war is not putin's war as we sometimes hear but that's the war that that is um, that could be considered the war of russian people so without a doubt um, putin is not an accident He's not a dictator who, who sort of cunningly came and kidnapped the country when they weren't looking. There were several elections. I lived in Russia from 2001 to 2010, when at the start there was still some choice. There was still some pluralism, obviously, in, you know, in Putin's first election, it's a fairly competitive election. Yeah, I think there was a lot of choice. There was a, a demand for authoritarian leadership in the in the cult of the Silne Ruka, you know, we need a strong hand to rule us, which is an authoritarian demand. But was it a real uh, popular desire or some kind of propaganda as well? Well propaganda can only work when it when it when it answers people's desires. That's what propaganda does. It understands people's desires and then manipulates them to its own to its own needs. Um, Putin waged the war in Chechnya, which was a, a, a war that really, you know, embraced the mass murder of civilians in a very, very proactive way, and which was celebrated. So there was clearly an appetite and an embracing of the sort of warfare that we saw then in, in Syria and now in Ukraine. Um, I remember talking to liberal elites, or not, not talking to them, this was very, very popular, liberal or so-called liberal elites in Russia said that we need a Pinochet you know, to enact economic reforms. There was a lot of conversation about we haven't dealt with democracy, we need some sort of authoritarian leadership. Um, now clearly now Putin is a dictator, there's no freedom of speech, etc, etc. There haven't been elections for a very long time. But, but his style of leadership, which was you know, an authoritarian style of leadership was also something that was chosen and that seemed to answer a deep demand within society. Um, but also historically, you know, these dictators, once they get into power, you know, they don't let go. But they often get there because they um, answer very, very, very deep, um, very deep needs and very deep desires. And I'd say the kind of the psychological underpinning of the Putin model, which is based on a sort of cycle of humiliation and aggression, it virtually always leads to a sort of a, a war policy. So I think that, that was always there. That was always very much there. This, you know, this myth of being betrayed and humiliated by someone, almost by its logic, demands aggression as an answer. So I think not just sort of in terms of policies, but also in terms of this deep psychological need that he seems to satisfy. I think, you know, that has very, very deep appeal. Um, yeah. Okay, but if, if we're speaking about deep appeal for the strong arm in Russia, what's happening to, to the other countries which seem to be infected by Putin or or some, somehow their politicians uh, tend to behave like Putin or, or sound like Putin, like starting from Italy or Hungary or Latin America. Uh, is it the new, the, the new fashion, the new, uh, or is it like um, in, in today's media 
circumstances, uh, having so social media, that's the way how politicians could um, attract more attention. What, what, what's, what's wrong with the world when uh, where uh, Putin-like politicians mm. are becoming uh, stronger and more popular? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of books being written about this and uh, there's a lot of discussion around this. Um, I'm trying to like, think of a very quick answer. What is the universal? Because that's kind of what I did in my second book. My first book was about yeah. Russia. My second book was like, oh my God, there's similar things happening across the world. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a bunch of facts. It's, it's, the strong, it's the strong man, the Bolsonaro, the Orban, the Salvini, the Putin, the Trump. Clearly, there's a bit of that going on. But it's not just that. It also comes with conspiratorial thinking that sort of replaced ideology. That is always a, a part of it as well. Uh, it comes with nostalgia. They're all nostalgists as well. So there's, it's not just the, the male thing. It's a whole bunch of, of, of values and, and forms of rhetoric and forms of thinking, which I suppose are united by a very aggressive form of identity. That's what they really have in common. And it's an identity that very much you know, sees enemies everywhere, which is very paranoid, very, very aggressive. And, you know, I've often sort of turned to, I like talking to psychoanalysts about this issue. Not that psychoanalysis, psychiatry can answer everything, but I always ask, but why? What's the appeal of this, this sort of construct? Um, and they often say, look, if we were to see this in a, in a child or a person, it's because, you know, the child feels very disorientated, they can't deal with the complex world, and they sort of take on these sort of modes of identity. Um, they can't deal with their own complexity as individuals, and so they sort of, they cast out of themselves any sort of nuance, and they become the strong male. I am just a strong male and nothing else, yeah? I'm in a world full of enemies. Um, so maybe there's something in that, you know, in a time of very rapid change where people feel very unstable, they look to these sort of simplified, very rigid and very aggressive forms of identity. Now, obviously that happened in Russia very radically after the end of the Soviet Union. There was a time of incredible flux and what emerges at the other end is this, is this model of identity. It's been happening all over the world you know, through social change, economic change, whole types of industry disappearing, a sense of instability, the 2008 crisis. We could almost go geography by geography. And I think we'll often notice that these figures are emerging in countries where an idea of development and the future disappeared. And there's a moment of chaos. And, and in that moment of chaos, these figures emerge. I mean, Hungary is very interesting. I mean, because Hungary is by far and away the strongest example in Europe. Orban is a, or this Orban that we have now, is a reaction to the 2008 crisis. We forget that Hungary had the worst financial crisis in Europe. The Hungarians felt completely abandoned by Brussels. They'd actually had a very, very soft ending of the Soviet, ending of the communist era. It was very, very smooth compared to the other places. So their big crisis came in 2008 and an Orban emerges. In Latin America, in India, a real sense that the reforms that in Latin America that started in the 80s and 90s had hit a dead end. In India, a sense that kind of the idea of modernization was going nowhere. So everywhere you have this crisis of a sense of development, a crisis of stability and stable identity, and then these, these figures emerge. Um, so I guess that's, that seems to be the overall, the overall uh, pattern. Um, they all give a model of identity that, that answers various needs. Um, definitely, it, it's connected with, um, with psychology, but at the same time, um, is there a strong influence of uh, anti-Americanism? Because in most countries where we, we have that uh, model of, of thinking, uh, including Russia, and like, when it comes to, to America, it's, it's American imperialism, probably, uh, what, what is the driver uh, behind Trump. Um, but 
all the rest um, uh, countries are very anti-American, and that's why uh, um, the, those anti-American politicians are using that uh, conspiracy theories and superstitions uh, of their supporters. Is is it also a politic, global political problem? Well, I don't know. I mean, if you listen to Bolsonaro or Orban, they're very pro-American. They just think America's, you know, lost its way and become too liberal. They appeal to, you know, there's, you know, and even, even, even sort of like, you'll know more about this than I know, even Putin sort of appeals to good Europe. There's good Europe with Berlusconi and Orban, and there's bad Europe with its liberals and gays. And there's good America with Trump, and there's bad America with Obama. So, so even there, it's more subtle. I don't think it's just anti-Americanism. Um, but again, I, again, I'm tempted to, to think about psychology. I mean, you know, the, the whole American thing, I mean, it reminds me a lot. So when we think about authoritarian personalities, it's often got to do with, you know, classically the interpretation from, you know, the sociology of the 1950s onwards has been to interpret it through really, really messed up relationships with your father. Yeah, you have, often you have a pattern of distant fathers, who both humiliate their children and the child craves their acceptance. And then you end up sort of compensating by taking on some of those, some of those, um, some of those behavioral traits. So especially with the Nazis, you found that consistently they came from families where the father was both very dis distant and very abusive. And the child wanted to somehow both, you know, be that father and yet hated that father as well. And you get locked in this humiliation, uh, uh, sort of slightly sadomasochistic relationship. Sometimes when, when, especially Russian propaganda talks about America, I feel they're talking about you know, some sort of family relationship, some sort of something that's gone wrong in their own relationships within the internal dynamics of Russia and then within families. It's like, you know, the sort of parent that you desperately want recognition from because you only exist when it notices you. Bear it. Yeah, sort of like, 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 come here, I'm going to come and fight you. Uh, but you desperately want its attention at the same time. You feel humiliated by it, then you want to humiliate it or humiliate somebody else because of it. I mean, there's something really weird going on there where the word America just seems to represent a whole, a whole, you know, a whole map of, of almost personal issues. Um, so I don't know, it's like, I mean, more practically, when you live in Russia, you spent your whole day being humiliated by the Kremlin, you know, by the tax police, by the cops, by your boss, you know, who's a sort of a, a stand-in for, for Putin, there's a Putin in every office. So you live in a culture of humiliation, and then you get home, and you switch on the TV, and you're told, America's been humiliating you all day. And so you kind of take all the resentment you've had built mm -hmm. up because of this system and you throw it onto America. So again, it's, I mean, when people talk about America, I'm not sure it is about geopolitics. It's, mm -hmm. it's a whole bunch of screwed up personal issues and screwed up sort of domestic political issues which get projected onto America. Um, so I'm not sure, is it really, really geopolitics or is it, is mm -hmm. it America is the symbol for all these other things? Mm -hmm. um, It, you might be watching um, how the perception of Russia um, has been changing uh, during the last half year. Uh, can you describe what, what has changed? How, how different is the attitude to Russia and Russians uh, in the West, in the West media? Mm. And what, what has happened? Well... There's no one Western media. I mean, there's, it's, 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 there's very different ones. But, complex, um, yeah. um, but so I live in, Eng I mean, I'm from England. I don't live there anymore, but, but I'm from there. So I don't think it has actually changed in England. In England, there's just a, uh, it's, it's, you know, an increase in what we had already. So, so Putin has already been cast as this malign actor, justifiably so for quite a long time in the British press. And to be honest, that goes back to, if we're looking at the cultural tradition of that, that goes back to the Cold War and also to the 19th century. It's very interesting rereading, I don't know, Oscar Wilde now, 
when he writes about politics, and he already sees in the 19th century looking at Russia as like the empire of evil and Russian Tsars as these bloodthirsty humiliators of their own people and other nations. So in, in England, the idea that the Kremlin is the source of evil is a very, very, very old tradition. So there's nothing really new there. It's just it's got much worse. Mm -hmm. But it's the same sort of, it's the same dramatic figure just getting, just increasing in its scale. In Europe, I don't know. You live in Germany, so I, I don't know. But, but I think overall, uh, it seems to me that in Germany, there was this idea that the Kremlin is a rational actor and that it took rational decisions and those decisions were somehow understandable and you could do deals with it and that it was big and powerful, but ultimately somehow reliable. And I don't know if that's changed. Um, and I don't know how much self-analysis there is in Germany about the extent to which they were living in a delusion about the Kremlin as a rational actor and Putin as a rational actor. And, and I don't know to what extent there's a, any self-analysis about whether Germany enabled that. Um, so, so I don't know, I think, I think there's very, very different dynamics in, in Europe. But, but in Britain, no, it's kind of more of the same, it's just a lot worse. Mm -hmm. But it's the same character, there hasn't been like a, a change. And what about America? No, again, again, most, look, in America there's a huge split. You know, there's, there's what we've seen in America is, um, what we've seen in America is, you know, the development of a whole body of opinion in America that likes Putin. Yeah, we've got Tucker Carlson, who is, yeah. who seems like uh, uh, Putin's yes. fan. Yes, and we could, we could think about why. Again, the appeal of the authoritarian personality. For this audience, the authoritarian personality appeals. So, I mean, that's a genuine appeal. But also, people like Tucker Carlson are contrarians. So whatever the mainstream or what he says is the mainstream likes, he doesn't like. So. A lot of this is just saying the opposite of what the White House is saying. So again, it's not a very, it might not, there's some genuine appeal and then there's just contrarianism. In America, I actually think the development, the interesting development is in the other direction. So it's not so much even about Russia supporting Ukraine as the first bipartisan issue in America and largely in American society since 9-11. It's the first time where actually most Republicans both voters and politicians support Ukraine. So for me, it's not so, what's interesting is not so much how Russia has changed, because that's usually just a change in scale, like how bad is this guy and how far is he ready to go? What's been interesting is the change around Ukraine, which either was perceived as something corrupt over there or wasn't perceived at all. It was completely empty for most people. Mm -hmm. So seeing Ukraine emerge as a voice and as a subject, has been very interesting. Um, and I think we still have a lot of analysis to do about how that happened and, and, and what it means and, and what that perception is. And that's really been the phenomenon. And uh, do they really know something or is it just a, an image of uh, President Zelensky? So Zelensky plays a huge role. I think, I think, I think that, that's played a huge role as a sort of anti-Putin. You know, mm -hmm. Putin is like this distant Tsar brimming with resentment and, and mm -hmm. bitterness with this, with this, you know, fixated stare. Behind the long table. Behind the long table, Zelensky is very human, very, very kind of warm, very empathetic. I mean, he's the exact opposite. So there's, yeah, it is, it is the contrast of two close-ups. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I think it gets, it gets interesting in, in so many levels. I mean, I mean, Americans, I think many Americans see bits of their own story in Ukraine's story, which is very interesting, sort of. Really? Yeah, because, uh, As you know. The American Revolutionary War against the British Empire? A little bit of that. That's a very deep American story. But yes, there's something of that that's very understandable for them. A former bit of the empire that wants to break free from the empire. Also, even more, if we're talking about the texture of it, they can see how the Ukrainian war is really fought by civil society. It's really, it's not just soldiers, it's grannies and people and businessmen. And here's the critical thing, farmers. The sight of Ukrainian farmers with their tractors pulling and destroying Russian tanks, I think appeals to 
you know, the farmers of Wyoming in ways that we might not quite understand. Because that story of the farmer who stood up to the British and the farmer who's a revolutionary warrior and a soldier as well is a huge part of, of the American story and the American psyche and the Republican story and the Republican psyche. And I think suddenly you had people in Wyoming going, oh my God, it's farmers farming and fighting an empire. And that went very, very, very deep. So, so there's these interesting echoes. Um, we also almost want to go market by market and see how, how that works. But it's been incredible. Uh, and maybe it helped that there wasn't much of an understanding of Ukraine before, because people could really just see it anew without too many preconceptions. So that for me has been a much more interesting story than the perception of Russia. Um, I think globally, whether you're Orban or Modi or somebody in Latin America, you maybe didn't care about Russia that much anyway, but you saw Russia as a way to balance America and China. And that's how Russia positioned itself in a lot of the world. And, and I wonder if that's changing. Because Russia put an amazing amount of investment into A, saying it's a stable energy ally, nuclear ally, military ally. That is, you know, it's the other big guy that you could use for your own balancing act. And I don't know if that's changing. I, know, I don't know if Russia is now seen as irrational, toxic, a bad partner. I mean, you saw the meeting between Xi Jinping and, and Putin the other day, and Xi just, he just didn't want to touch Putin because, you know, he's messing up. You know, the biggest crime isn't even being evil. The biggest crime for a lot of these people is being incompetent. And suddenly Russia might be looking incompetent, irrational, and just a bad person to have any kind of dealings with. So I don't know if that's changing, because that would be a very big change, because Russia has invested hugely in that image of projecting that image of itself as this, this nasty but stable partner. Mm -hmm. Besides, the, there is a lot of talk in the West how, how it's possible to help Ukraine to win the war, or how it's, it's possible to help Ukraine to do something with Russia. Um, are there any possibilities uh, for, for the West, not, not financially or not militarily, to tackle Russian propaganda or to tackle that uh, image of Russian empire? Um, yes, obviously. Um, but I think several things have to happen for this to become more effective. A, I think we have to get beyond this framing where it's little Ukraine attacked by big Russia. We need to help them out of philanthropy or values. I think we have to start seeing what this is. We're, in a, we're also, whether we like it or not, in conflict with Russia. Russia uses military action in Ukraine. In Europe, it uses energy. In the world, it uses hunger uses disinformation and corruption everywhere, and, and Russia sees itself as in conflict with us. So we have to start recognizing that it's our conflict too, um, firstly, and that it's not, we're not just helping Ukraine, we're part of a continuum. Um, in terms of effective information campaigns globally, I think the secret will be putting together Ukraine's capabilities and international capabilities sort of need the equivalent in the information campaign space that we have with the weapons. So in the weapons, you have this amazing, really, I think, unprecedented coordination of Western weapons, Ukrainian soldiers coming together. It's really quite unheard of what's happened. It's, it's, it's very, very new. We need something similar in the information space. How can what Ukraine does very well, which is largely to do with Zelensky's profile and his you know, appeals to other nations, how can that come together with the different skills and leverages that other countries have? So what do I mean? In practice, Ukraine needs help in Latin America. Yeah, there is still a big problem in Latin America where most Latin American countries are on a default level allied with Russia. Historically, tactically, many reasons. Ukraine needs help there. So it can't really do it itself. There's not, many, there's not much leverage Ukraine has. There's no real reason for people there to start listening to Ukraine. America or Britain helping in Latin America or Africa is a disaster. You know, America is the most hated country in Latin America. However, there's countries like Ireland who are hugely popular in the cultural media sort of world in Latin America. 
um, because they're also victims of colonization. So Ireland could be the sort of friend that introduces Ukraine in terms of cultural diplomacy in Latin America. Or let's take somewhere like, like Hungary. Hungary's a big problem. Yeah, Hungary is a country that is you know, stopping sanctions inside the EU, doing deals with Russia. But when you dig into Hungary, you realize that apart from maybe some personal financial interest around Russia, generally, this is seen as a clever thing to do for Hungary. You know, Hungary has its own ideology of having always been betrayed by everyone. And it's clever for it to sort of do a deal with Russia while balancing America and all this stuff. There's no deep love of Russia. Everybody remembers 1956. Everybody thinks the Russians are, you know, their own sort of dangerous imperialists. So what could one do with a country like Hungary? You know, there's only so much the Ukrainians can do. They can sort of build trust with the Hungarian military by doing joint operations on the border, for example. But there's not much else they can do. They don't have serious ways to get into the Hungarian media space. However, you know, we could think of a sort of a joint, uh, a joint campaign. The Ukrainians build trust with the Hungarian military by doing joint uh, security and border trust building. Poland and the Czech Republic and the other Visegrad countries pressure Orban on the diplomatic level, saying we won't support you in the EU if you carry on playing this negative role vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. There's a huge role for anti-corruption research to really turn up the heat on the elements in the Orban, the Orban solar system of money and power to really start digging into their connections to Russian business, which we suspect continue. So you have all these actors doing different things, and together we can have some sort of cumulative effect. Um, but coordinating that, thinking through that, understanding how to leverage those different effects, that takes a little bit of coordination. Um, and again, I don't think that's ever been tried before, not in any kind of systemic way. So I think something like that is necessary. Um, you know, Russia has its huge influence machine. It's got energy, corruption, media. It's quite centralized. It's quite focused. Nobody can really compete with that. Nobody has anything like that. Only authoritarian countries have something like that. But democracies have all these different elements which they can bring together, like, like the Transformers. Let's come back to propaganda. Um, I don't know why, but many people in, in Europe, as well as, I guess, many people in America, consider their media they watch on a daily basis a propaganda. If we ask some, some Germans or some French, they, they would say that our television is propaganda. Why? Why, why there is no more trust to the uh, public television? Yeah, I mean, the word propaganda is a really hard one. It's, it's a word that has many meanings. And, and people just usually use it in very, very, uh, in very different ways. Um, but without getting into the academic debate, I suspect what people mean when they say propaganda is that it is somebody trying to manipulate them in their own interests. Yeah, that these media aren't, as media claim to be, the voice of the people, you know, Journalists like to claim that they're helping people. Mm -hmm. What they probably mean when they say it's propaganda, actually there is this media is answering the interests, not of the public, but of, of somebody else. The owners of the media, the cultural biases of the journalists. I think that's what people mean. And, and when people say they feel it's not objective, because people always say we feel it's not objective. Again, I think that's what they mean. It's not in their interests. And this is what's happened in so many places. People don't feel that institutions, you know, ministries, education institutions, bureaucracies, media are in their interests. And I think that's on us. I think we messed up. I think we assumed a loyal audience. I think we assumed that people believed us when we said, we're doing this for you. And maybe we stop looking at the world through their eyes. I mean, if there's one thing that we have to start doing is understanding the world through the eyes of the people who feel this. That doesn't mean agreeing with their racism, if they're racists, but it's actually understanding 
how they see the world and the challenges that they face. So I think that's a little bit on us as well. You know, I think, I think we may have got a bit lazy. On us, you mean? All... On media, no, yeah, I think we messed up. I think we messed up. We got stuck into an old mode that was related to a broadcast model of one to many. We are here to bring the truth for you, oh little people. Let us enlighten you from our wonderful pulpit. And maybe that was poss possible. And now once people have social media with, uh, with their own uh, narratives and with, with someone who, is, um, yeah. who has an opinion shared by them, Yeah, I think, I think even it, if it's racist or even, even if it's... Uh, the, 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 there's that. And also just, I think, people's sense of self has changed. It's very interesting looking at the Biden administration in the US. So they are doing all these big projects to help people. They are doing these big infrastructure projects, you know, welfare. And I think their communications theory was very much from the mid 20th century. So Biden thinks a lot of Roosevelt who did these great campaigns in America to help people, the New Deal. But Roosevelt lived in an age of one-to-many communications. He, was, he revolutionized it. He would go on the radio, first president to do this, and explain to people, mm -hmm. fireside chats, I'm gonna explain to you what we're doing. We're developing the welfare state to help you. And it worked amazingly. I think the Biden guys thought we were in the same era, that I will come in this very patrician way and say, we are doing this for you. Something's changed. Media isn't just a form of communication, it's a form of people's sense of themselves. I think nowadays people have to feel Prichestia or Sochestia. You know, the genius or the evil genius of a Trump is that people felt that they were part of part of the movement themselves. Even by retweeting, you know, they're mm -hmm. somehow part of it. And it's very easy to use social media for this kind of very, very aggressive type of mob mentality or group psychology. But if you're communicating reforms and all these sort of issues, you probably have to think about that as well. How do you make people not just feel that they're a part of it, but actually include them in it? I just think that's the model of communication that we're in. So what does that mean for journalism? I don't think it's enough for the New York Times to say, here is our wonderful piece of journalism that is for you, the little people. I think it'll mean things like engagement journalism, which is a big movement in the US and, and other places where you start bringing people into the editorial process much earlier, where you start responding to their needs much earlier, whether through digital means or by creating town halls or even bringing them into the newsroom. So they feel they are part of the process. You're not, I don't believe in the whole citizen journalism thing. I think journalism is a profession. It's a bit like citizen doctors. It's, I don't believe this stuff. I think journalists have to do the journalism, but the relationship with the audience changes where you make them much more part of the process. And there's many, many way, different ways of doing that. I think that's probably the shift that we have to do um, in order to rebuild this key relationship. I mean, we're meant to be doing this for the people. You know, journalism is meant to be, you know, we're meant to be the tribunes of the people, holding power to account for the people. We have all these assumptions and these myths about who we are. And I think we believed our own myths without actually thinking how to make them real. So to be positive, I think there's a way out of this. Mm -hmm. And I think we see this in the US, the, the most popular things that US media did the last few years, I think it was the New Yorker and the New York Times who did it, was these big investigations and then bringing about social change around terrible water conditions. It was poison water in, in Michigan. And that was media who drove that. And media showed that they can actually work on behalf of the people and change something for them. And in those places, sort of, you know, they were very, very popular. So I think that's the way to go. And I think that's what people mean when they say they feel that elite media are propaganda. Mm -hmm. um, you've heard that uh, even before the war, Russian uh, propaganda has been claiming that uh, they hate us. The world, the whole world is against us. There is a huge conspiracy against Russia and, and so on. Um, after the war started, uh, Russian media and uh, some Russians who, who live abroad as well have started um, saying that there is some kind of cancel culture against Russian, Russians. Um, now with uh, all those new uh, visa ban initiatives, uh, even Russian liberal media uh, are claiming that there is new Iron Curtain, 
but now it's erected by the West, by the Western Europe. Um, do you think that those initiatives would could help uh, could help Ukraine to win the war, or could be effective sanction um, against Russia? And do you do you feel that 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 could be called cancel culture for against Russia, against R Russians? Okay, so there's, there's a lot of questions within that within that question. So. Look, we're, we're all seeing the Kremlin's internal polling. You know, this is the wonderful thing about the currents of the wonderful. The interesting thing about this current situation is because people who work with the Kremlin hate the Kremlin, they're leaking everything. And we know historically as well that if we're talking about this sort of like sanctions policy and the communication of the sanctions policy and these sort of people to people sanctions. Whether it's South Africans during apartheid or Russians now, they don't. Identification with the state goes down when they feel the state has brought them to a place of isolation. So it really isn't the policy that matters, it's the communication of the policy. People always bunch together when they feel they're under threat. That's just what they do. If they feel the government has brought them to this place of threat, then they're against the government. This is the big lesson from, from the story of South Africa and sanctions. So I'm talking about, like, let's say you did these visa bans, and I'm not for or against, or I can tell you what I think should be done, but let's say they are done, and you're using them as a tool of communication, if you're doing that. I'm not saying that you should, but if you do that, then you'd have to think about this dynamic. If, you're, if you want to use them as a way to undermine the regime, it's the communication around the policy that matters. So that's that part of the debate. It can be the same policy, it's how you communicate it. What the West has completely failed to do, and I'm quite shocked by this, is that it's initiated a sanctions policy towards Russia without an information policy, thus allowing Putin to shape all perceptions within Russia. And sanctions are all about perception. Of course, they'll have an economic sort of consequence as well. But no one's in danger of starving. Yeah? There's not going to be food riots in the next two months. So it's all about perception. And I don't see how you start a sanctions policy without an information campaign to go with it. Imagine you're doing economic reforms without an information campaign. It's, it's just, it's unprofessional. It's negligence. So if you were to do this visa stuff, you'd have to think about that component, firstly. Secondly, I think it's very, very important that when a country, any country, but in this case Russia, breaks so many agreements, responsibilities, and promises, and understandings, it's very important that, that there are consequences, that people who live in Russia understand there are consequences, and that it's not the same as before. So I think we need a visa policy that is commensurate with the new situation. We should have to start from zero again. Forget about the Schengen, forget about all of that. Let's start from zero again. What is the visa policy that you have with a country that is waging a genocidal war, that is a security threat to the rest of Europe, and whose main argument is, we will get away with it. And we live in a new world where you can do this and nothing matters. And we should start from scratch and go, okay, so what is the visa policy to that? So yeah, I would definitely forget about the visa policy we've had so far and start from scratch again. And then we can have a serious debate with experts in this field about what that should be. So that's even without the social effect. I mean, what is the visa policy you have with a country like this? Same as what is the trade policy you have? You know, what is the, what is the, everything starts from scratch. Russia has torn up the rule book. Okay, what are the new rules? So, so that's the stuff on that. On, what was the other question you asked about everybody hates us? 
Yeah, uh, just uh, this this mm -hmm. visa policy um, probably eliminates the potential allies of uh, of the. Um, depends how you do it. Um, who are these potential allies? I mean, that's that's a very sort of complicated game to play. You know, like, um, but we would have to get into who you think the allies are and what you're trying to do with that. But but. I'm, st I'm speaking yeah. about uh, Russian society. Mm. The remainings of Russian civil society, we, we know it existed and, mm -hmm. and like some, some people are still protesting. Mm. And I, mm. I, there, are, there are people in Russia who are mm. vocal and who are not uh, supporting the war. Mm. And, like, and the, the, those people are targeted as well as um, the members of the United Russia. Mm. Um, so if you're talking about visa policy, I don't think visa policy is some magical instrument of like social change. Um, I think we're talking much more broadly here about principles, about norms, uh, and about um, and, ab and about rules. So so Russia has torn up the rule book. You need new rules. I mean, I think that's just that's that's not a that's not a difficult thing to understand. Um, I think the, if we're talking about, you know, the overall, you know, sentiment around Putin, Putin's great argument is that, that he can tear up rule books and get away with it. You have to show that, no, he can't get away with it in all, in all sectors. So I think you can't really, once you're beyond that, you're into sort of very, very subtle games, which I, I don't know if they work or don't work. Um, I don't know. It's, 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 I'm trying to think through what you're saying here. So you're going to alienate... The, what, the bits of Russian society that are protesting and therefore you shouldn't, you shouldn't do it? I mean, but then you shouldn't have sanctions either and then you shouldn't do anything. I mean, you might alienate them for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, so, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you should give, you should have a visa policy that makes it easy for anybody who's facing humanitarian persecution in Russia to, to escape and be given shelter. That's completely clear. That's what we can do. You know? So in that sense, that's how you... That's how you ensure that, that this bit of society is cared for, you know? So if there are people who genuinely protest and need humanitarian visas, you make sure that's really, really, really easy for them to do. Um, that, that's, that's the response. I mean, that's what you can do through the visa policy. Um, I, don't, I don't... I know, it's actually a question for you. You know Russia much more than I do. I suppose, I suppose there's two things you can do. So Putin is saying the rest of the world, we're at war with NATO. You either say, you're not at war with NATO, this is ridiculous, we love you guys, yeah? Or you say, oh yes, you're at war with us. And that was very stupid of you. Why did you take your people into this war? Because you're gonna lose. If we agree that most Russians see the world as a dog-eat-dog -dog place, they don't believe in international systems, they don't believe in, in sort of relationships of mutual interest. They buy into the overall conspiratorial framing of a world where tough people bully each other because that's the world they know. I think there's probably quite a lot of research that will confirm that most people believe that. If they don't even believe a priori in the possibility of some sort of world of mutual interests, then should the response be yes, you've chosen to go to war with us and you're going to lose. And your ruler is a moron who has chosen a war which he will lose. Maybe that's the right response, I don't know. Maybe we should you know, stop saying, stop avoiding it. Say, yeah, war. What was that phrase that, that the Soviets use? Zlaya skulak pitalizma or whatever, what was it? Zvidi the, the, the... Well, maybe it's time to show some Zvidi skulak. I, I don't know, I don't know. Um, trying to prove to Russians that actually the world doesn't work in the way they think it does is really hard. Let me ask a personal question. Uh, do you feel yourself um, any, any prejudice against yourself? Because like you've got Russian surname, you've got very diverse biography, you were born in Kiev, uh, studied in Germany in, and in Britain, but then worked in Russia um, and like, uh, um, contributed to Gazprom Media TV channel. Does this 
experience um, is this experience uh, being used against you some, somehow? Do, do you feel something, um, some prejudice against you? I'm just thinking who from. Uh, do, do you consider yourself to be a possible target of, um, not, if not sanctions, but um, of prejudice against Russian people? Firstly, I don't think there's any prejudice against Russian people. Um, in any, in any systemic way, so I'm not sure what that would even mean. Um, and no, I've, 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 I've always been very lucky in the sense it would have, to the extent that it happened a little bit was during the Cold War when I was a small child and I lived in this weird paradox when my parents were Soviet dissidents and so opposed to the regime and they came to London but still I was the Russian, even though I was Ukrainian but I was the Russian in school and therefore called a Russian spy. So in the Cold War, there was this paradox of, even though my personal history was from a background of being in opposition and persecuted by, by the regime, in England I was still sort of teased as like, oh, you're the Russian spy, ha ha ha. But it didn't go very deep. Quite the opposite, I've always been, I'm very lucky that I've always lived in urban cosmopolitan environments where my difference was celebrated rather than critiqued in any way. But I guess I'm just very lucky. I'm also Jewish, living in an era of minimal anti-Semitism and in an environment of minimal anti-Semitism. So I think I'm just very, very lucky. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. It, the question is so strange to me. I'm just not, I can't even like think about the answer. So you, uh, you never felt any, any kind of affiliation to the um, to the community that that is is being labeled as Buddhist people just because they they, they had Russian background. No, I'm, I'm or, I quite worked for for Russian um, company as you did. Well, no, I mean quite the opposite. I mean, I, I get accused of being Russophobic, but by people, but I don't take them very seriously, so it doesn't really matter. So I get I get the Russophobia thing a lot. I get that I'm Russophobic and that. Uh, with hints of anti-Semitism always, you know. Mm -hmm. I get some of that on online. It's like, ah, oh, you know, Pomerantsev is a Jewish son, and everyone knows that. Of course he's Russophobic, and Putin stands up for nationalism. But do you pay attention to Twitter trolls or Kisilovo or something like that? I mean, you know, I don't know. One thing that living in Russia told me is that you don't react to, you know, to things like that. Yeah, that, uh, for me, it's, it's the recipe how to to keep calm and uh, and go on, like never pay attention. I get put in lists of I get put in lists of russophobes, so I get I get some of that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning of this war, uh, I was talking to to Francis Fukuyama, and he told me that one hundred percent he's sure that that after Putin would have lost this war, he uh, he would lose the power in Russia. Because once he's not a str strong man, one, one he's not the winner, everyone would just dump him. Um, and his regime would be over because he had lost. Uh, do you think that uh, that could be that easy? Or at the same time, uh, there is another point of view that um, uh, even after he's gone, all those, uh, like the system would remain and the psychology of the people um, would remain. And probably like the generation that was raised under Putin and that is being raised by today's Putin's propaganda is going to remain with us and is going to, um, to spread his ideas and, and like, um, his ideas are going to be alive for years to come. Putin's <laughs> ideas? <laughs> um, um, okay, Putin's um, infection, let's, let's call it this way. Yeah, the sort of weaponization of, of resentment, you know, that's the Putin thing. I mean, if you sort of st I mean, that's what Putin does quite effectively in his performances, you know. I don't think the ideas are very coherent. 
you know, he seems to change his rationale for invading Ukraine every two seconds, but what he performs quite effectively in his, in his public persona is this sort of performance of being both the humiliated, you know, he's always talking about how Russia has been humiliated and he's very good at performing humiliation, and then humiliating others. You know, he's, he's, he, he, he captures both sides of, of the sickness of, of Russian political psychology. You know, he's, he, through him, people can experience their sense of humiliation and then their sense of humiliating others. So in one performance, he will go from being everybody's picking on us, even physically, you know, he controls, comes like Gollum, like small and resentful, and then sort of swells with aggression towards others. So that cycle of humiliation and aggression is something that does sit very, very deeply and is, is it's not even about elites, that's experienced every day in Russia all the time and historically through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of, of, of various types of abuse and trauma which have never been addressed. So if you're going to have to you know, deal with those things, you're going to have to start dealing with some of these issues, both the, the stories of, and the history of internal repression and of course what is completely ignored in Russia is the history of colonialism and repressing others. I was always very shocked in Russia when I'd ask people like, who do you think used to live in Sochi? And they'd be like, Russians? Like, no, there was an ethnic cleansing. Like, no one's, no one's even heard of it. There's complete amnesia about Russia's multiple colonial crimes. So you'd have to start dealing with that. To get beyond this underlying, you know, sickness, you'd have to start dealing with all of that and surfacing it and getting beyond it. And, you know, will it last beyond Putin? I mean, it's up to people like you. Um, will you be able to... Not just you, I'm not putting everything on your shoulders. But most things. Will you be able to deal with that? Historically, countries have. Germany dealt with it, sort of. Japan dealt with it, sort of. But look, I mean, in America, they're dealing with it all the time. All these fights in America are about trying to come to terms with their own history of, of internal fascism, you know, which is around racism. So, but they're trying to deal with it all the time. So it's very, very hard. It's very tempestuous. But that is a society trying to deal with its sicknesses and trying to find something else. So that's the process we'd have to go through. Um, but that's a long process and that depends on a lot of things changing. And, and there'll be windows of opportunity, like there was a window of opportunity at the start of the 90s, which, which we lost. Um, and, and so it is possible. You know, there are examples that, that, it's, that it's possible, but it often comes after a very big defeat. I mean, a very big defeat. And I don't know the nature of that very big defeat, but, you know, I suppose people do have to go in a very fundamental way that the way we've been doing things has led us into the abyss. So there's going to have to be a defeat. Um, I don't know what form that takes. Thank you. Okay, cool.